Um, the topic of this is, and trust me, I didn't develop any of the topics, structuring the welding shop experience. So um, I think some of the slides that I just witnessed that, uh, that was included in David's presentation prior to this uh, has a lot of neat stuff that can be talked about as far as making that lab experience more interesting for the students. Uh, I, I just believe that um, if we're going to have students do something, then they're going to have to be interested in it. We're going to have to hold their attention. If we don't, we're going to lose students. It's just plain and simple. Um, and I'll use another trade as an example. We've had, we've had students in our automotive programs that come in and um, I've had actually transfer students come in at semester. And I always ask why. Uh, you know, you, you spent, you spent uh, nine weeks in there, actually 18 weeks in there a semester. And so why would you want to transfer? I mean, is it because you had a light bulb go off uh, and you wanted to change careers or what's the reason or the rationale for coming in here at this point in time? And more often than not, the answer is, well, you know, I came in there, I went in there to be able to work on automobiles. And all I done was change oil and, and done service work and lube, grease, that type of thing, pack some wheel bearings, etc. And so, in essence, the, uh, the answer was that student wasn't getting enough or at least what he expected or she expected from that program. So now they're in search of something that is more interesting. And I believe that's the whole foundation of, of what we do. Now, with that being said, I am a firm believer, and the older I get, the more time I spend in the classroom. When I first started out, um, I wanted to be in the lab all the time. And if uh, you can probably, most of you agree with me, your students want to be in the lab most all the time, right? How many of you have students that want to be in the classroom more than the lab? Show of hands. Okay, right. Now, <clears throat> so with that question being said and, and a uh, negative reply, how many of you believe that is extremely important, just as important to be in the classroom as it is in the lab? Show of hands there. So we've got a few more. <clears throat> now, the other day we had a kind of a panel discussion and um, I made the statement during that discussion that I believe my philosophy is that I must challenge every single student in my classroom or in my class that's enrolled. And I also spoke of a student that I have, and it's not the first one, that can't read. Okay? So we go, we go through all these literacy strategies in professional development as, as teachers and uh, we just got through going, one, going through one last month with a lady from Birmingham, Alabama. And um, she got done and spent a whole day there and she was gonna come back the next day and walk around and look at what we're doing in our programs. And um, you've, had, you've had presentations about lesson plans. And so it all kind of collates together. The thing about the lesson plans that I didn't see at the bottom, I think that there needs to be one line added at the bottom of that, that checklist that uh, Larry went through yesterday of everything that needs to be incorporated in a lesson plan. If you were here for that, there's one thing in my opinion needs to be added to the bottom, and that is, did it work? Or was it effective? Or what can I do different to make it more effective? Because if we just write a lesson plan, and we're going to be uh, have a wonderful experience in the in the in the shop, then it has to be interesting, it has to be informational, and you need to evaluate your lesson plan because it's all about 
challenge in that student. So we talk about the student that comes in that can't read or reads on a second or third grade level, doing math on a second or third grade level, whatever the case may be. We have to challenge that student. We have to challenge that center student, the group of students that the, that's the average student. We also have to challenge the high-end student. And that's the one we often forget about, or the one or two that we often forget about. We just take for granted that he or she's going to be interested in what we're doing because they're advanced a little more. I, I think that can't be farther from the truth. I think they're probably going to be the first ones that get bored with what we do. That's just my opinion. So I also said the other day that um, we have all kinds of jobs across this country uh, in, in the welding industry. And it goes all the way up to welding engineers. So and just picture your class in your heads for a moment and look at their bright, shining faces, all with smiles and being energetic to be there energized and ready to go, and uh, just pick out the ones you think that could have the possibility of going on to a four-year institution and becoming a welding engineer. So my point is, you have to make it a good experience both in the classroom and the lab for all students. Um, the first thing I do is and I get several comments about this, mostly negative. I get it, I understand. And also, I don't care. But I always start every single class, every single year, my junior class, which is my beginners, um, on oxyfuel welding. Now, many people say, well, hell, we don't even do that anymore. Okay, I understand and I get it. Um, but, I will just about guarantee you that if you do that or try that, that will make your kids better TIG welders. Okay, and even with the high cost of acetylene right now, because we've got a calcium carbide plant down, it's still going to be cheaper to train them on acetylene, oxyfuel, than GTAW. If you take into, the, into account that what a tungsten electrode costs, what a ceramic cup costs, the consumables that goes into that torch, that they're going to destroy, even the torch itself, okay? There's a difference between a fixed head and a, and a flexed head torch. And if you don't explain that to your students, then all of your fixed head torches become flexed head torches, <laughs> correct? <laughs> About two times, right? And then, and then what do you do with them? What do you do with them, just off subject, but what do you do with them after they're broken? Anybody have any ideas? I yeah? Sure, good point. Anybody else got any? Yes, sir? I cut them apart and show them the coils inside so they can see how you know, the cooling goes through and you can see how the hose is coming in. Another excellent point. Anybody else? Okay, I got one more. Um, picture yourself or picture one of your students and you cringe every time they do it and they take that tungsten electrode to a pedestal grinder because we can't afford a tungsten grinding machine. And, and how are they sharpen it? What are they sharpening it on? Pedestal grinder, right? Okay, and they're not pointing it down, sharpening it, why? Because it's gonna leave a little portion there that's gonna melt off and go into the weld. We're gonna have a tungsten inclusion, correct? Okay, so we point it upward. Grinding stone rotating this way, tungsten pointing up, and you cringe because if it catches it, it's gonna go through the palm of their hand. So use that broken torch, put the parts back on it, let them be holding that with the tungsten sticking out, sharpening it. Just a thought. Okay? So there's things that we can do even if they destroy something. But like you guys said, the, the first thing is show them what happens if you flex a, a uh, fixed head TIG torch. So anyway, so how can we make it the shop experience exciting for or more exciting for all? or productive for all. Um, I don't know how everybody grades, and maybe grades is a bad word. I like to use the word how you evaluate. Um, we do several evaluations. Um, 
I've, by the end of the school year, I've got, and if I took them all out of the filing cabinet and uh, in manila file folders and stacked them on the table, for every assignment that we give that we evaluate, the stack's about that tall for a given school year. Now, there's many things that we do that we don't evaluate, or at least I do. Um, and I'll just touch on that for a second. Um, in order to challenge every student that we have, we must find out where every student is. Correct? So a real simple exa uh, example is, when I give a tape measure test to find out who can and who can't read a tape measure, I do not evaluate that exercise. Because all I'm really doing is finding out where everybody is. If you don't do that, then you're going to leave somebody behind. And the problem with that is, that student's probably been left behind since second grade. Okay? So, um, hand out the tape measure examination, actually two of them, and you, but make sure you let them know ahead of time that you're, it's not going to be evaluated. It's not going to be graded. Okay? First of all, when you mention a tape measure test or fractions, um, the first response, uh, the auditory first response is, oh crap or the eyes get big, we got to do fractions? Yeah, and guess what? We're going to do them without a calculator. And then it even gets worse. So they go into panic mode. Um, but see, see where they are. Evaluate where they are. You might have to spend some extra time with individual students getting them back up where you need to, where you need to begin your lesson. Um, and then once you show them how we apply fractions in our trade, the light comes on. And then they have no problem adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing fractions. In fact, they will say, why did all right, they? I've had some say every year, why didn't they show me that in fifth grade or sixth grade or whatever the case was? And you've all experienced it, right? So it's nothing new. Very simple. Um, one of the things that I do is I ask, before I give this assessment that I don't evaluate, I ask the question, how many can read a tape measure? And most hands go up. Has that ever happened to you? Okay, and then I ask the question, okay, what's half of seven-eighths? And you walk around for three minutes and nobody said a word and you say, anybody, just, just tell me what half of seven-eighths is. They're like, well, that's not reading a tape measure. Well, well sure it is. <laughs> but when they realize that all you have to do <clears throat> is leave the top number the same and double the bottom number, that's it. That's when they say, really? You're kidding me. Why didn't they show me that in fifth grade? It, it's, it's so elementary, it is almost ridiculous. Now, on the same topic, I've done this for the first five or six years. I, I do it every year, but about five or six years into my teaching career, I got to thinking to myself, am I doing something wrong? So I went across to the high school, and I talked to a really good friend of mine that, that taught high school calculus. And I said, Mr. Nolan, I said, um, will you do me a favor? Sure, what do you need? I said, I've got this tape measure evaluation, the two of them, and uh, real quick, there's about 16 questions on one and about 20 questions on the other. And all it really is is a tape measure thrown up there with arrows pointing to a specific increment. All I really want them to do is tell me what the arrow's going to. That's how simple it gets. And uh, I said, would you mind, I'll make the copies, would you mind handing them out to your calculus class? When it's done, put them back in my mailbox. I'll grade them, mark the names out. Nobody will see anything. And then I'd like to share the results with you. Sure. OK, cool. So I make the copies. I put them in a manila folder. I go put them in his mailbox. <clears throat> 
about, and I said, no, no hurry on this, just whenever you find time in class. And about three days later, I get the folder back, and I start looking through it. What do you think I found? Same thing. Same identical thing. I said, wait a minute. These are calculus students. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely correct. The problem is the students that we have today is so reliant on the calculator because they, math classes, I don't know if they, in your area, we had math classes in high school that done nothing but talk about calculator functions. All right, if you have an, if you have a, an equation of whatever, then here's the calculator function for it. Okay, so when they're shown something like what I just explained to you, they're lost if they can't use a calculator. And so how sad is that? We do the same thing with reading. It's amazing how we get juniors in high school and we have to be math teacher, science teacher, reading teacher, counselor. Your, your kids talk to you more than they talk to their counselor, right? Because you show them you care about them and they understand that. It's like respect. You respect them, they're going to respect you. How many times have you had a kid come to you and say, Mr. So-and-so, can I, you know, I, I need to talk to you two, three minutes, whatever the case may be. Um, think about this for a second. How many of you see your, or how many of you have your kids clock time more than they see their parents in a week's time? How many kids you have that work after school, whether it be McDonald's or anywhere else, and work on the weekends, and your clock time with that student in a week's time is more than they spend with their parents. Makes sense? It, it's sad. It's sad. So, <clears throat> how, do you make, how do you make this shop time a great experience for them? You first must care about them. And second, you must challenge every single student that you have. Now, it doesn't matter necessarily. The, when we start... Shield of Metal Arc. Uh, remember I told you, we spend more time in the classroom now than I did 10 years ago. More classroom time this year than I did last year. <clears throat> because there's some components in the SENSE program that can really open the eyes to your higher level students. And you can really get them excited about becoming an inspector or a supervisor or whatever the case may be. And they see that. And they see an opportunity for them. Now, <clears throat> David showed a slide that the average pays $16 an hour, and that's something from coming from our high school welding programs. He said that's without your two-year college additional training. <clears throat> um, and you have to understand that come from the Department of Labor and, and so on. So it's, it's an average. We all know that geographical areas, there's a lot more exposure. We also know that if our students are willing to travel, that they can make twice that much money and more, right? The issue is, how do you get them to travel, okay? Also, in the panel discussion I said the other day, it's, it's hard to get that student to move. Even if there's jobs paying and you show them what you have... How many of you have um, former students come in and show you a pay stub for what they just made? Anybody? Well, that does that. <laughs> we all know the answer to that question, but I'll just go ahead and ask it. Does that excite your current students? Does that start interest there? Oh yeah. Absolutely. Almost interested me to go. Absolutely, it does. And and yes. Absolutely it does. So when I'm able to write on my whiteboard at school that, and I don't put any names on there, but I had a student that made $138,000 in 2009. 2009 was a tough year and uh, worked nine months. Those kind, Money matters, but you also have to talk to them about there's more, there's more important things than just money. 
health insurance is a huge, huge, huge thing right now. And it's going to just become nothing but, but more importantly to, to our students. Because at 18 years old, what are they? They're 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Nothing's going to happen to me. I don't need health insurance. So, and, you know, what, what are the reasons that they don't want to move? You know, um, it's a true story. That's how we start all of our stories in Missouri. This is a true story. <clears throat> um, had a former student, and uh, I introduced him to, um, to Ronnie Vanskoy that spoke here Tuesday, and he got him, uh, gave him a contact of the Boilermakers in, I think it's Houston area, and um, he's 19 years old. And his supervisor came up to him and he said, um, Ethan, you have a passport? Yeah, I've got a passport. He said, well, I have a job in, in Africa, two-year job, Africa. And he says, it's in a man camp, like you just pointed out. So the cost of living is zero dollars as far as food and shelter. And he says, Ethan, this is going to pay $350,000, two years. Ethan, the, Ethan says... I'm not going to Africa, I'm getting married. So the interesting part of this was uh, his dad, actually he called, called me at school and they were uh, putting in a, uh, a fireplace insert and their fireplace insert, the fireplace that they were gonna put this insert didn't have a damper. So he, he wanted to come in and make a, a damper for this fireplace thing. I said, sure, come on in. So he brought his dad and I've known his dad all my life. And so his dad's telling me this story. So after they're done, I'm talking to Ethan. I said, are you sure that's what you want to do? Yep, yep. And I knew he was engaged to this girl. He was engaged to her before he left high school. And I said, Ethan, I said, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get married. I'm, you know, I'm not God. I can't look down and, and uh, chart a path for you. So, but I said... I'll just leave you with this thought. What a way to test that relationship. If you love her and she loves you, go for two years, make your $350,000, come back. If she still loves you, marry her, build a new house, have it paid for, buy a new vehicle and have it paid for, buy you a farm, put some cattle on it because his dad's a farmer, and look what you have. Nope, getting married. Well, Ethan got married. Eight months later, got divorced. Now, we all have stories like that, right? We all can relate to those type of stories. So, one of the things about making an effective um, lab session or classroom session, as far as that goes, appealing or exciting to students is when those when those former students come back, have them put on their hood or give them your hood and, and put two or three uh, students together in groups and rotate them around and let that student show them exactly what they do in the real world. Does that make sense? Now let me ask you another question. Uh, anybody ever sent your students to um, a place uh, uh, like a... Um, a private welding school, Lincoln School, uh, Tulsa Welding School. There's several across the United States. Hobart has some. Anybody ever sent your students to one of those? Okay. So when they come back, when they come back, have you ever asked the question, okay, if you had this all to do over again, what would you do different in this class? Because hindsight's 2020 most of the time. What do they tell you? Do, do, have you ever asked them that question? Okay, ask them that question. I'm going to tell you what they're going to tell you. They're going to say, I would have spent every waking moment that I possibly could in that booth, burning rod, burning wire, whatever. That's what they're going to tell you. Because they realize how important it is. Because that's what they're doing at Hobart or at Lincoln or at Tulsa. They're welding for eight hours a day or close. Missouri, we have Missouri Welding Institute just north of us about an hour and a half, and they have eight hour a day hood time. 
So we have them for two hours, two and a half hours. We have some students for one hour. It's a challenge. So it's, and, and, and you know, are they always on task even for two and a half hours or two hours? No, no, they're not. They're not. But make it as real world as possible. My, my challenge to you would be make your shop experience as close to real life as possible. And what are you going to hear from them? Well, it's going to be different because when they get out there, they're going to be paying me for this. Okay? Well, the more you learn here, the more they're going to pay you out there, or at least eventually pay you out there. Right? They might not start you off at, at $38 an hour. And also, I think it's important to uh, give them the, when I say real world experience, give them a nine inch grinder and have them grind all day. Give them a carbon arc torch and have them carbon arc for two and a half hours. And then, and then make them understand that your first job, your first day very well might be running that nine inch grinder for eight hours or 12 hours or that carbon arc torch. Okay? And it's okay to tell them that, you know, don't go out there and kill yourself, but make sure you give them their money's worth. Don't be laying down. How many of you have similar situations or do similar things that he, that he just said? Excellent. If you don't, if you don't do that, uh, if you don't have that opportunity or the resources, uh, try to put in for an engine drive. Now, you don't have to have a $20,000 stainless steel engine drive. Just get an engine drive, okay? And make them weld outside off an engine drive, okay? In our, in our lab, we designed in the center of it, it's 70 feet long, it's 41 feet wide, and in the center of it, we have an enclosed grinding room. Now, it's enclosed, but it's got a bunch of windows so I can see in there, okay? Because we all know what's going to happen if, if we don't have windows going in there, <clears throat> okay? And so I've got kids grinding in there all day, but I've enclosed it because I don't want that stuff. It it's already gets, you know, too much of it everywhere anyway. The IT people love our department when they come down and work on a computer, okay? <clears throat> but but uh, do things like that. Get an engine drive, make them weld outside. Now, I'm not going to tell you to make them weld outside in the rain or if it's below a certain temperature or whatever the case may be because more often than not, that's going to come back to bite you. Um, but try to, make it, try to make that lab experience as close to real life as you possibly can. And when those former students come back, they can... What an inspiration they are. So use that inspiration. They're coming back to see you. They're coming back to thank you is what they're doing. So they will be more than happy to spend some time there. Bring some people from your advisory committee in and have them show some of the things that they do in the real world life. Here's the issue. The way society has changed and... Uh, I don't know if you agree or disagree with this, and I'm no scientific um, statistician, but the way society is today, these kids want exactly what they want, and they want it now. They're not willing to wait. Now, it, how many people agree with that, that, that well with kids every single day? Okay. <clears throat> So, with that said, give it to them now. It, it, we've all heard the phrase, been there, done that, right? Well, change that. Be there, do that. When they want it, give it to them. Now, I don't mean give it to them free. I'm not talking about walking through the parking lot and, watch and see what they drive. Because... If I walk through our high school parking lot, I see 80% vehicles that's much better than nicer, nicer than the ones I drive. Okay? One of the problems is they've been given everything that they want 
and they've been giving it to them now. We've got, we've got new Chevy Camaros, and I'm sure next school year we'll have convertible Chevy Camaros because that, they're just now coming out. And those college students are paying something to get in there, you see? So, <clears throat> and, and I don't know if you can do this or not and get by with it. Uh, some states are different, some local school districts are different, but uh, those, TIG, those TIG consumables I was talking about earlier, I furnish every, every single student with a set. And I've got a price on what it cost us. And if they break a cup, they buy a cup. I'm giving them the first set. But if they break one, they buy one. And it's in my syllabus and that's just, that's just how it is. There's, <clears throat> there is no jewelry allowed in my lab, zero. And no, I don't care if it's plastic, zero. You got, you got metal in your mouth or in your face, you got, <clears throat> you got um, two choices. You can sit in the classroom and get a zero, or you can go down and talk to the director about it. Either way, you're going to get a zero. You know, it's, it's in my syllabus. Our syllabus has to be approved by our administrator, but it, it's, in, it's in the syllabus. So, uh, and, and to tell you, and also, maybe the, one of the most important things with any teacher is, or instructor, is that you got to be fair to everybody. The same rules apply, and I tell, I tell them right up front. We have a parent night that all new students are required to come in in orientation. I tell them straight out, I don't care who you are, I don't care what your last name is, I don't care what your mom and dad do for a living, it makes no difference to me, this is the class syllabus and this is what we'll follow, period. I have triplet boys, they'll be 21 in April. Two of them started my class. One of them got kicked out. And that's fact. <laughs> they came to me, I'll never forget the day, the afternoon. They came to me <clears throat> one late afternoon, came up together and sat on the couch. Well, you kind of know something's up, you know. And they said, is it okay with you if we go in welding, welding class? And I said, sure, absolutely, if that's what you want to do. Are you sure that's what you want to do? Yep, yep, yep. I said, okay, understand this. I'm going to be harder on you than I will be everybody else because you're my child. Okay. Well, <clears throat> uh, one got his ear pierced, and he didn't want to take that out. And I said, okay, son. There you go. So he went down and talked to the boss. The boss said, well, Blake, if you want to stay in, in his class, you're going to have to take that earring out. You change classes. Now, that didn't affect anything at home, which was, a good, which was a good thing, but be fair. Now, back to that part about being fair and then going back to an assignment that you give them, there's nothing that upsets me more as a parent and probably even more so as a student, if I can remember that far back, was to take time and effort doing a homework assignment or a research paper turning it in, and then, oh, I've decided not to take that for a grade. What? Are you kidding me? My point is, you better assess everything, and except for the, the ones that you don't, but make sure you tell them that you're not gonna do it before they start it, so they know. I mean, it's, there's no difference in what we do. It's like asking us to do a job and not get paid for it, right? No, no different. So it's okay to give them an assessment <clears throat> and evaluate that assessment, pull the data, but if you're not going to put it in the grade book, then let them know ahead of time. Because as a student, even as a parent, my daughter come home and she spent time on the computer doing a research, whatever it was. And I said, well, how'd that go? Well, I, you know, I think it went pretty good. I, you know, had to give up, get him in front of a class and present it, and I think it went pretty good and seemed to be enjoyable. And I said, well, what kind of grade did you get on it? Well, after everybody was done, she decided not to give a grade for it. That just burnt me up. Now, I'm going to take that into the next thing I talk about, which real briefly is uh, how many of you have computer labs in your classroom area? How many, okay, of how many computers in there? 
22, that's the perfect scenario. I, I would give anything to have 22. Actually, I just need 20 because that's our cutoff number. I'd give anything in the world if I had 20 computers in my classroom. But I guess my point is, um, if you don't have them in your classroom, the next question would be, do your students have access to a computer lab? Can you go down the hall to a computer lab? Okay, if that's the case, I would strongly encourage everybody in here to give them a re something to research that has to do with welding, of course, okay? YouTube videos. If, you're, if your school will not allow you, if your IT department will not allow you to go to YouTube, there's YouTube for teachers. You can get, you can get around that. Um, Miller Electric has a lot of great, great videos on YouTube. Okay? But do, do, have them do some computer research. They're going to have to be somewhat computer literate or they're going to fall behind. Okay? So make them do a PowerPoint presentation. Um, anybody ever heard of, is it, I always call it Prezi. Is that the correct, Dave, is that how you say it? Prezi? You heard of Prezi? Yeah. Have them do a Prezi PowerPoint presentation. Now, Prezi, it takes a little bit for them to get used to it and how it all works, but it's just kind of a, a new way online to do a PowerPoint presentation. Put them in groups of two or three and have them all work collaborative on, collaboratively on it and develop and, and uh, present in front of the class a PowerPoint presentation. Please spell it. P-R-E-Z-I, I, I believe. I, I'm checking it out. Okay. Um, and there is, if, if you're a school, they have a free version of Prezi. You don't have to, they have a pay part, but if you're within a school district, they will let you do it for free. Yes, sir? It's P-R-E-Z-I. P-R-E-Z-I. And it's kind of cool. And because it's different, remember we talked, David talked about technology, new technology. It's just a new form of putting together a PowerPoint presentation and not the old from the Microsoft Office product. So they like something new. They can incorporate a YouTube video right in it, just, you know, with, with right there off of one computer so they're not having to, you know, do a whole lot of typing or whatever the case may be. Um, if you can't do that, have them definitely get up in front of the class and give a presentation. Are they going to like it? That's my question. Are they going to like it? No. No, they're not going to like it. They're not going to like it. I, one of the biggest disagreements I had with my daughter was I told her when she was uh, doing her high school schedule, making her high school schedule, they do that in eighth grade where I live, and um, to chart the career pathway, the eighth grade counselor helps them schedule their freshman year in high school. I said, sweetheart, I said, um, there's one class I'm going to make you take. And, you know, you get the, the sad face. Well, what's that? And I said, you're going to take speech and debate. And she said, no, I'm not. And, uh, and it was just, at the time, it was just her and I in the house. And I don't mean just that night. It was that way for, uh, for eight years. And um, so we sat down and we talked about it. She said, Dad, <clears throat> I do not want to do speech and debate. And I said, okay. I said, we'll come to a compromise. I said, you'll take the speech and debate portion of the class, but you don't have to do any competitions with speech and debate. You don't have to go on the competitions and do that kind of thing. Everybody know what I'm talking about? And she finally, reluctantly, um, agreed to that, to that uh, compromise. And, uh, and after she was done, not with the class, after she was finished with high school and, and went into some college and, and when she applied for her first job that had, I, I'm going to be off on this, uh, but like 172 applicants for one job opening, and she got the job is when she came to me and said, Dad, thanks. 
because I had to give up, get up in front of a boardroom full of people and give a presentation. She's never, knock on wood, and I'm not saying she's the smartest kid in the world, and if you all know me, you would understand that's understandable. <laughs> she came from you, Ed. She can't be the most intelligent uh, young lady in the world, but she has never, ever applied for a job that she didn't get. And she attributes all that to that one class. And, of course, what she, you know, the knowledge that she's acquired from her other classes. But being able to sell their self is extremely important, especially the way the economy is. You know, we can talk about a student can leave your program with a certification. That just simply opens the door. Okay, they're still going to be tested. And they're also going to be interviewed. And more than likely, they're going to have to take a test. And that test is going to have some math on it, right? So it's got to be well-rounded, and you have to challenge all students. Is there some cool things that you can do in the classroom or in the lab? Sure there is. Have fun. Most, in my syllabus, in my expectations to my students, the last thing says, have a little fun along the way. That's my last expectation. My expectation is pretty tough. But the last one says, have a little fun along the way. And we try to do that. So, you know, how many of you saw Larry's thing yesterday about about pouring the um, baking soda vinegar mix, just the gas portion through the paper towel tube, putting out the candle, putting out the candle that was lit. Absolutely a wonderful, very easy and cheap way to show them about shield, what shielding gas does. So there's all kinds of things that we can do in class that makes it interesting. It's... Uh, it's just how you do it. I've, I've been in welding programs, and, and you know, it, it's, um, you wonder. I always try to put myself in the student's shoes. If I was a student, would I enjoy doing this? So, and we talked about earlier in the week uh, articulated credit. We have, we're, we sit right between two community colleges just about 45 miles from each one of them. And uh, one of them has started welding programs in our facility this year. And I, this, this year is, I've had boss number four this year in, four, in the last four years. So life's been a little tough. But um, one of those community colleges gives our students 16 credit hours. They complete my course, they get 16 credit hours at that college. The other one's 12. So mom and dad like that because mom and dad's going to be the ones writing the check for them to go. And I don't know how your state is, but our state is, uh, in, in our agreements anyway, that they have to take one welding course and pass it, and then at the end of that semester, that's when they transcribe those 16 and or 12 college credits on their transcript. So it's a huge benefit to not only the student, as, but as well as the parents. How many of you have a plus program in your states where a student maintains a certain GPA at the high school, uh, doesn't miss more than X amount of days during high school, and, and then they require 50 hours of community service or mentoring, okay? So what we do is, what I do is, I allow that to happen with those second year students helping the first year students, and then I log that time, and they send it back, they, take, they carry it back to their high school, and they turn it in, that, they get all their mentoring hours right there. And that also helps mom and dad. What it does in our state is, all I, have to, all I had to pay for my student, my child, to go to community college was purchase his books and pay his way, as far as the gas money getting back and forth to class. The uh, college tuition is paid for through a plus program. So, anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much.